Welcome to the fourth episode of Belgian Mole Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Helmsdown, and joining me for the first time in a little while and slightly later than planned is my fellow Brit who, let's be honest, has probably earned more on quiz apps than the team earned in Belgian Mole this week, Anthony Williams. And good afternoon. Only just, it has not been a good week. It has not been a good week for either the Belgian Mole contestants, or the lady who uploads Belgian Mole for us, or me on the quiz apps. It's getting really frustrating. (laughs) It's getting really hard. I've got a target I want to cash out on, and I thought it was like days away, and it's now drifting off into the distance. I may have to re-evaluate. I cashed out a few days ago, and I think I've played six games of cash show and won 4p. (laughs) <laughs> sounds about right it's wonderfully appropriate because we're recording this just after half 12 on saturday finally and uh, we've both just played cash show and got to about question seven or eight i went out on question six so and no money again yes rubbish don't don't do it <laughs> i am getting to the point of giving up i think i might get to get another couple of quid and then that's it i'm done it's so annoying because i just want money <laughs> <laughs> so how have you been over the past eight weeks or so yeah i've been pretty good thank you life's not too bad i've been thoroughly enjoying my first season of belgian mole i'm really really getting into it it, it could be by the end of this season it may well have overtaken and become my favorite version yeah anyone who loves logan will potentially be missing him but ant is the perfect replacement because ant watched dutch mole before logan did ant used to watch it with me and um yeah and I think has as bad a record on this sort of show as I do. Oh, I'm terrible. And and I love it. I'm getting good with Dutch Mole. I'm terrible with Belgian Mole. I, I love the fact that I never, ever get them all because it makes the, the final episode so much more fun. I think I'd be really disappointed if I got them all early on and then just sat watching the whole show thinking, yeah, I know, I know, get over it. It's the exact same feeling I have whenever I watch a Belgian Mole finale of going into it going, oh, I think the person who ends up winning is the Mole, and then me just sitting there going, are you kidding me? Is this happening again? Oh, for crying out loud. Because that's happened both Belgian Mole seasons that I've watched. I am notoriously bad at this. Yeah, I'm really bad, and I think I'm particularly uh, bad at picking up on things that that are there to throw me off the scent. So I'm sure we'll come to it this week, but I have more suspicions this week, but I'm pretty sure I've been led to think that they're the mole. So, which I'm fine with. I don't mind. I, I'm not bothered. In the first three weeks, who were your, who were on your suspect list? Um, mine's not really changed much. I've been high on Lloyd from pretty much day one, to be honest. And me and Logan basically discounted him. Yeah. Uh, which was interesting, which is what I'm saying. I, I strongly suspect I'm being drawn towards Lloyd, but he just seems to be doing some really odd stuff, so I don't know. Having said that, Lloyd is on my suspect list this week. There's three people on my suspect list, two new people, or two more new people. Okay. Are you still high on Steve? I am. Steve week? is still my number one, because he just keeps positioning himself in the best place to sabotage if the games weren't going badly already. You see, I, I think the opposite this week. I thought he was in a really bad place to mole, but okay. So previously, Steve knew nothing about popular music, or literally any music, actually, let's be honest. He knew nothing. <laughs> it's dreadful. Peter got thrown around on top of a car, Lloyd and Baha got drunk before everyone negotiated to take a piece of the pot with them to Mexico City, and it was Jeffrey who missed the flight and got executed. <sighs> Was he anywhere on your list? He wasn't, no. I found him deeply, deeply irritating. Yeah. Interestingly, I think this previously had a hint. Okay, go on. Because every single week you watch the previously on Belgian Mole segment, and the last person shown is always the person executed. They mm. always finish with the red screen. They didn't this week. It's the first time I've ever seen them not do it. Mm-hmm. Because Pascal was the only person after Jeffrey. Yep. So Pascal, by default, is now on my suspect list, as well as, you know, sabotaging the luchador task. Ah, okay, interesting. Hmm, yeah, Pascal's kind of hovering around for me. The logic behind it for me is that they love to have a hint of the one person who can never be executed. It's Mm -hmm. way more prevalent in the Dutch seasons, but they love to have the hint of the the only person who can't go home is the mole. Mm -hmm. So to have the mole be the only person who can't get executed after the person who is executed maybe is a little hint. I don't know how flimsy that reasoning is, to be honest. But Yeah, it would be. Yeah. 
Okay. There was also a bit in the previously that I thought was significant, which was the bit of Lloyd throwing the briefcase away. I don't know why they needed to include that bit. So, And we find out that Mexico City has 24 million people. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Which is a lot of people. Considering I was having a conversation at work this week about how Beijing has about 20 million people, that's ridiculous that Mexico City has even more. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And you could kind of see it in the scenes. It's a crazy place. And in the first game, Gilles is initially looking for two art lovers, and they nominate Stephen Cadreen as the two old people. I know, I thought he was talking to us right then. I was like, yeah, we love art. Not anymore, he's abandoned us. (laughs) Yeah, we did love him until he decided to leave. I'm a Rick fan girl now. (laughs) And the two old people can then go to the nearby art museum and study a projection of a massive Mexican painting for their part of the challenge. And the other five must, using Stephen Cadreen's help, identify the four parcels which they must deliver within two hours. However, there are 46 parcels around the fountain in the park, and they must solve four puzzles. And in giving the correct answer, Gilles will give them a part of the painting that Stephen Cadreen can see in order to identify which parcels need delivering. If they're correct, they get an envelope in return which contains a thousand euros. And if they're wrong, well, they get an abandoned building and potentially stabbed. (laughs) <laughs> and this is one of the things right that i wanted to talk about is that this impresses me so much about this show is that they go to so much effort that there's 46 potential locations and each of those addresses have to go somewhere right it's not like they just make up an address they're all real addresses. 46 and there's only four of them that actually lead to to a, the the prize. It's like wow, it just blows my mind. They do everything on such a big scale in this show. It's brilliant. And in theory, they actually have to have people situated at all forty six, just in case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's got to be some destination where otherwise, you know, what's going to happen? Like you said, they just go off into some some shanty town and get stabbed or something. So yeah, it, it's just so so cool the way they do that. I think I love Belgian Mole for different reasons than I love Vidim. Vidim I love because it is all about sort of the game. It's more modern Survivor. Whereas Belgian Mole is proper travel log, ridiculous scale. We know exactly what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As friend of the podcast, Bindles, put it so beautifully, it's the hammer ops of Mole Seasons. Mm -hmm. Because they love doing crazy stuff. Yeah, and, and they just go for it. Everything's just really well thought out. So in the first puzzle, Lloyd and Peter must move two matches from the number 5008 to make the highest number possible. And this is another Gilles de Costa dick moment, I'm the smartest person in Belgium. (laughs) Because not only did they get this one wrong twice, Gilles ends up having to explain it. Yeah, I mean, this was just ridiculous, off the scale difficult, right? I mean, it's hard enough to do. And then, you, then you've got the whole, oh, and by the way, you could have just done it upside down. It's like, what? That's never going to happen. But the mechanic, the whole mechanics of this game were just ridiculous. That You've no idea whether you've got the answer right or wrong until like an hour later when you've been there and back to find out it's the wrong location. This is just evil. It's an evil game. And also, this puzzle compared to the other three was ridiculously hard. Yeah, and but but what's clever about it is on the face of it, it looks really simple. So I do, I do kind of like that, but uh, yeah, I don't think they were ever going to get that. The other three are definitely doable. This one, really not. <laughs> so initially they picked 9,900, and the bike is really not that responsive. <laughs> With all that traffic, I was like, oh my god, they are so going to hit something. And in the second puzzle, Yoko, Pascal and Baha have a world map to piece together and must work out which of Brussels, Cape Town and Sydney is the closest to Mexico City. And Yoko basically screws this entire game by getting her shoelaces out. Yeah, very clever. See, there's only been one week when she's been in my suspect list and that was the first week when we didn't really know much about her. She's playing far too hard to be a mole right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's not even that she's just being like over enthusiastic and screwing things up. She's actually playing quite smart as well, isn't she? She is one hundred percent my win pick for the season. Mm. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. There's no one else I can see having any sort of winner's edit unless someone bumbles their way into the correct mall. Yeah, no, I think you might be right. And Catherine refuses to hang up the phone so she can eavesdrop on the three of them. Yeah, which I thought was quite smart. So this was the one part this week where I thought, 
Steve was being a little bit suspicious, which is why does he want her to hang up? What what benefit is there to not hear what's going on at the other end? But then I was thinking about that. And if you were the mole, why would you say that? Because why would you draw attention to yourself? I don't know. It just it was it was odd, but it didn't feel like moling enough to me. The reason that feels like the mole position for me is there's two main sabotages you can do, really. One is getting the puzzles wrong, and one is getting the painting wrong. Mm-hmm. Or not leading people away. So Steve and Katrina were in the position, assuming Steve's the mole, which, let's be honest, he is. <laughs> Spoilers, he's not. <laughs> he will know which, which four are correct. Okay, yeah. If he knows that they're on the right lines, he could um in inverted commas, struggle to find it, to waste time, for example. Yeah, okay. That is definitely a position to sabotage in. Because I don't think the mole would put themselves on the bikes purely because there's people around them to catch them sabotaging. If they're on the back of the bike, going slowly, just sort of looking round, not only are the camera's going to catch it and it'll make the editing harder, but also the person on in the car will feel it. Yeah, and and also there's not a lot you can do other than just be quite slow or get lost or something. There's there's not much to play with there, is there, that wouldn't be obvious. No, I, I would have thought the best position for the mole would be in, in solving the puzzles and then just going along with wrong answers, which is what I think we might have seen a little bit of. Yeah, you can't really sabotage on the bike, so it has to be in one of those two positions, really. Mm-hmm. But I didn't see any evidence of it. We didn't see, or or we didn't appear to see them feeding the wrong answers to anybody. No, because there was one that Steve and Katrine really struggled with. Mm-hmm. Leading to the iconic quote, which I was so, so tempted to make your intro this week, which is, I think it might be a hermaphrodite. No, no, it's definitely a man. <laughs> yeah. And in the third puzzle, they are given five banknotes, which is a thousand Mexican pesos, 200 South African rand, 500,000 Vietnamese dong, 20 euros and five pounds and they must rank them from high to low mm, this this was the bit where i thought there was some odd behavior going because they came very very quickly to an answer based on i can't remember what the vietnamese currency is called but i'm pretty sure pretty sure it was worth this when i bought a visa and they just go along with it it's like well, surely you'd want to fact check that and it's not like you know they're not allowed to go and ask people stuff surely they could have just got a smartphone off someone and just looked them up yeah, me being me, my sense of how much the Vietnamese dong is worth is originally due to Vietnamese Amazing Race and the fact mm. that it's three hundred million that they win, and I think that was about twenty five thousand pounds when I last checked. Mm-hmm. And also, Vietnam is ridiculously cheap. Yeah, having been there, and now weirdly, I'm going there again. I wasn't even intending on it. It's super cheap. It's probably the cheapest place I've ever been. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to put Vietnamese dong quite low. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that would have been my instinct, because, yeah, everybody knows there's squillions of them. The pound, whilst it's rebounding, is still quite weak at the moment, so you'd put that quite low. And you definitely know it's lower than euro. Yeah. Rand, I have no concept of how much it is. Yeah. And then pesos, you kind of think after ten days in Mexico you'd know how much a peso's worth. Would be my my suspicion. And obviously they should know how much a euro is worth, so... Well, yeah, of course. I mean, that would be what they're benchmarking everything against. But yeah, it just seemed like they came very, very quickly to an answer. And then even after they've given an answer, Peter and Baha try and completely ignore the name that's supposed to be on the package. Mm-hmm. Are you sure it's not the Spanish for Scott? No, chaps, it's not. And we also get another iconic quote, which is, uh, it's a miracle the bomb squad hasn't come to destroy the boxes. <laughs> yes. That <laughs> did make me chuckle. Something tells me the Mexican police may have been tipped off. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> I'd be a little bit worried if it's perfectly normal to leave 46 boxes lying around in the middle of a square. 46 is such an odd number for there to be as well. I guess it's how many people there are in that mural. Yeah, but you can have some even more decoys if you really want. Yeah, yeah. And in the final puzzle, there are nine bags of sweets, and they must find the one bag that is of a different weight. However, they can only weigh the bags three times... Yeah, I was impressed with this. This is the kind of thing that I used to really struggle with at school when they used to ask you to do these puzzles. But they, they seem to got to it really, really quickly and figured it out and got it right. So, good job. Do you know how to do it? Because there's a really easy solution to this one, actually. Oh, I'm sure there is. They were kind of explaining it, but yeah, I can't remember how you do it. So, because there's nine bags, you completely ignore one of the bags. Doesn't matter which one. You then weigh four on each side. 
they're balanced. You know the one you've left aside is the outlier. Mm -hmm. If they're not, then you pick one of the packs of four, weigh two on each side. If that balances, you can discount those four. And then you do the same with two. Yeah. Yeah, that works. That's how you do it. Because nine was deliberately chosen as a number. So that's actually Mm -hmm. probably the easiest of the puzzles. Maybe the map was an easier one, but that's actually probably the easiest of the puzzles, if you ask me. Yep. And in the end, they only actually get the second puzzle correct, so they only win a thousand euros out of a possible four thousand. Yeah, yet again, not not a great uh, result. No, I haven't. I've not done the maths on how much they could have won had they not been mauled so much. But in this episode alone, it was thirteen thousand euros. They won one. Wow, that's massive. So, in the second game, Gilles is looking for two brawlers, and they pick Baha and Peter. <laughs> Holy Peter. <laughs> That's brilliant. You have to know, if you're on a show like Belgian Mall, there's going to be the stereotypes. Of course. So there's going to be the Mexican wrestling. So as soon as Gilles says, I basically need two people to fight for a living, you go, I know exactly what that task is going to be. I'm not touching it with a barge pole. Absolutely, <laughs> it was just great. I really enjoyed it. I thought I thought the wrestlers were fantastic. I just love how Peter kept just riling up his tutor. Yeah, it's like this man is can beat the shit out of you. What are you doing? I loved it. It was like so we're just acting, right? Is this acting? <laughs> it was brilliant. Holy Peter, big bar. <laughs> Are you acting now? Are you an actor? <laughs> it was great. He kind of reminded me of Papa Lazaru from the League of Gentlemen. <laughs> You're my wife now, Peter. Yeah. Peter. <laughs> and the other five are taken to an abandoned warehouse where they will play a classic style mole game. I love this sort of mole game. Yes, this was great. Really well constructed. I loved it. It's a, a variation on the uh, Hitchcock Hotel game. Mm-hmm. And Stephen Pascal are locked in a room with a paint bomb, and Yoko, Katrine, and Lloyd have one hour to defuse it. And they have to travel through three rooms in order to get to them, and each one will provide them with a colour to avoid when defusing the bomb at the end. And if they defuse the bomb, they win 3,000 euros. Now, did they know that about the colour thing? I couldn't figure out if the narrator was just telling us that they were looking out for colours, because they didn't seem particularly tuned into it. I think they were told that they needed to look out for colours. But they okay. weren't told necessarily what they would need to do with them. Right, that makes sense. So in the first room, they have to answer five trivia questions by turning switches to either on or off. And to power the screens displaying the answers, they must exercise on a treadmill, cross trainer, or stationary bike. And this also powers the screen that Pascal and Steve can see, which shows images from the previous few days, with just one colour, which is red, missing. And that is mm-hmm. the first colour that they must avoid. However, this wasn't made that obvious to them that Steve and Pascal would be able to see anything. And also, this is probably no. the most moleable position for anyone to be in. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I see your logic there, because if, yeah, if Pascal doesn't notice, then you just keep shtum. Yeah, best case scenario for Steve as my mole. Either Pascal doesn't notice, or they don't work out the relevance of it. And even mm-hmm. if they do work out the relevance of it, and they've got like 30 minutes left to defuse his bomb... One wrong wire will set the bomb off and lose the challenge anyway. Mm -hmm. If Steve knows the relevance of red, he can tell them to cut red. Mm -hmm. Which would be what I would do if I were mole. Yep. Because it's the one colour where actually no one other than those two knew it existed. Yeah, that makes sense. And then if she does realise, then you just play along with it and you figure out something later. But if that because that comes up quite early, he knows that if nobody spots that red is significant, then he can he can quite happily contribute on everything else, can't he? Because they're never going to get it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Worst case scenario for him, they get a one in two chance of winning. Mm. It's significantly lower odds for them than they should have mm-hmm. if everyone was playing along. Mm. Having said that, the other one of my main mole suspects this week was in the room with him, so it could easily be Pascal who was leading Steve along. Could be. Or it could be the people in the other room who have my mole suspect who are just really bad at doing stuff. (laughs) They're really bad at doing stuff, but logically I don't think they would pick another young mole. Well, I don't know. See, 
they're double guessing you there, aren't they? You, you're immediately thinking it's not another young one, so when better to have another young mole? <laughs> they are, but they've had two on the run. Both yeah. of the previous two moles have been under the age of 30. Okay. I, 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 that's what I'm saying, is that I think I'm being told to think it's Lloyd. <laughs> I'm, I'm second-guessing myself. There, there seems to be an awful lot pointing towards Lloyd, and I don't think it would be that obvious. So I'm, I'm putting it out there that if it is Lloyd, I've said I've spotted him, and if it's not, I've said that's because I'm not supposed to. <laughs> there is a subtle clue for Lloyd coming up, I will say, that I didn't spot or didn't know about on my watch of it last night. But okay. I saw someone point something out on Reddit, which is in the vein of mole clues and does refer to Lloyd. Okay. And in the second room, Lloyd does get to play a Lucha Libre game on the PlayStation, and if he wins, he gets five extra minutes on the timer. If he loses, they lose five minutes off the timer. And Katrina and Yoka can spend that time searching the room for clues, leading them to the piano, and once Lloyd loses... They get the three keys, which they must play to get out of the room. And when they play the piano, Time of Your Life plays to Stephen Pascal, leading them to know not to cut the green wire. Mm-hmm. Now, the the molable position in this one is Lloyd's. Because the longer he spends playing the PlayStation, that's wasting more than five minutes. Yep, exactly. Best thing to do in that case is to just immediately try and lose. Yeah, but I don't know. Do you, do you think that way when you're in the moment? Because you, you're thinking oh, I should win this and we'll win five minutes. I don't know whether you're thinking, oh, I'll just sacrifice it and we lose anyway. I don't know. It's kind of, kind of like taking the lower offer, that is, isn't it? You know, it might it might be strategically the right thing to do, but it's not going to go down well. Yeah, the difference is if Lloyd loses the game, he doesn't get death threats on Twitter. <laughs> and she's subtly hinting that a guy in the year above me at school was on the chase this week and took the lower offer. And boy, did he get some comments. It's only a game, guys. It's only a game. I occasionally try and point out some of the best rage tweets from um, from the chase hashtag to people when I'm discussing the chase because it's just a wonderful phenomenon. No other show in the country has that much vitriol for contestants when they do things. It's no. it's wonderful. I'd, I'd love it if someone ran some stats and found out that actually you're more likely to win anything if you take the lower offer. But there you go. Because given at that stage, you haven't actually won anything anyway, so what does it matter? See, if it was me, and if someone had got back before me, I would consider taking the lower offer just because it gets you an extra step in the final chase. But also, exactly. it's another brain. If I was alone, yeah. though, I wouldn't want anyone taking the lower offer because I would want to play on my own because I'm much faster doing quick fire without buzzing. Yeah, I've, I've always said that. I think your two best chances of winning are all four or just one. I would love to. To, to be alone in the final chase if it was me. Yeah, that's the way to do it. As well as the fact that I'm really selfish, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to split the cash then. <laughs> I would be more than happy to, to play for the 40 grand that the woman before him um, took to the, the table on my own. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. So in the third room, they must use a magnifying glass to find two miniaturised questions on sheets of paper in the room. Where is the White House, and what colour is the odd one out in a sequence of colours? If they get the White House answer correct, they can leave the room, but answering blue lets them know not to cut that wire. And was it just me, or was that just not, like, the classic trick question that everybody should know the answer to? You know, that's like the old, if red houses are made of red house, red bricks and blue houses are made of blue bricks, what's a greenhouse made of? Glass! <laughs> It's just, it's like, where is the White House? <laughs> it's in Washington, that's the answer. And they don't work it out until it's too late, basically. No, and again, who's the person who's not working it out? Until magically, when it is too late, he suddenly remembers what the answer might be. That was too obvious, though. That's what I mean. <laughs> that was more obvious than Steve's moling last week, mm. in my opinion. Regardless of the fact that I've suspected Steve from, from week one. Steve at least was trying to be subtle last week, whereas Lloyd really wasn't. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. And yeah, Steve and Pascal get the the memorial paint bomb. <laughs> and uh, no money's earned for this challenge again. Another one, no money. The Ruth memorial paint bomb, as I'm calling it. <laughs> You've not seen that challenge, have you? Oh, I've just remembered. No, I don't <gasps> think so. It's one of the best challenges ever created. Okay. In Belgium all 2016, the first person eliminated had a chance to return to the game, 
if everyone else helps her. And she was locked in a taxi out in the uh, the yard and was told that if she entered the correct code, the doors would open and she would uh, be able to return to the game with some money. If the timer ran out, a paint bomb went off in the car and she was eliminated. No prizes for getting what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Baha and Peter find out that they need to choreograph a Lucha Libre routine containing five moves from a possible 20, and if the other five can identify all five, they earn 3,000 euros, but one wrong answer will cost them everything. This was brilliant. I enjoyed this so much. Just watching them wrestle was just great. I really enjoyed it. It was so funny. Peter just did not learn his lesson to stop riling up the Luchadors. <laughs> no, no. He just kept going and kept going, and it, it was just so funny. I really, really loved it. I could have quite happily just watched the whole thing of being a, a wrestling challenge. It was great. It's just incredibly stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's so much fun. I just love it. And I know a lot of people have suspected Peter going forward, mainly because of all the like religious imagery and stuff, but as Logan said a few weeks ago, it's Mexico. It's a very Catholic country. Yeah, you're going to see that. And I don't think there's any hidden clues that have really pointed to Peter that much. No, no and I, I, I just don't feel that he is the mole. It feels like the mole's either someone who you're going to see lots of or very little of, and he's kind of just there and thereabouts all the time, isn't he? So Yeah, he has some good reactions with the whole being on top of a car that's uh, being spun around a racetrack. But oh, That was a crazy challenge. That was the point where I, I thought Peter can never be the mole because the mole would not put themselves on top of a car. No, no, there is no way you would do that. If if you knew what was coming up, you're not going to put yourself forward to do that. No, you'd put yourself in a subtle position like maybe the exercise bike with the traffic lights. <laughs> or or maybe changing the wheel on a car and doing it really badly. <laughs> and the remaining five people get three minutes before the, the match to learn the moves. I don't think they were ever going to get this, you know. Peter and Baja would have had to be so good to make it so clear because you've just not got time to get it into your head what you're looking at and you know you're looking you've got to figure out what the move is and then you've got to hope that they're good enough to execute it in a way that you get what it is i I would have been very shocked if they'd have got all these right yeah and this is a challenge where i think the mole can just sit back yeah there's no real moling that would work on this one because unless you are in the ring well, the mole usually doesn't choose to separate themselves from the group where possible, especially when this game is worth as much and you can still have control over it Yeah, as the one that the mole was probably playing. Yeah, and they were separated for a long time as well, so you were away from the main group for far too long if you were the mole. You would have to have faith in the ineptitude of the main group to not win 3,000 euros. Yeah. But I think it's a tough enough challenge. You, you're right. You can just sit back. I suppose if you got to the final one and you got them all right, you could maybe just jump in. But other than that, I think you just expect someone's going to get this wrong. Yeah. And Lloyd did answer correctly, can I point out? Mm-hmm. Which maybe is just to diminish the, the mole target on his back. Exactly. He knows someone's going to screw it up. And after two correct answers, Pascal, as she loves to do, ruins everything and they get no money. Yep. They're getting used to that, though. It's okay. <laughs> They're flying. Another 3,000 euros goes begging. Yeah. And Baha says in a confessional, my ankle hurts, my groin really hurts. <laughs> I bet it does. And yet we see nothing from Peter, who was throat chopped at least three times. <laughs> it's because he can't talk. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't have a fractured windpipe or something. He was getting proper clotheslined. And talking of injuries, Katrine manages to injure herself falling down the stairs. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I I am terrible at identifying who the mole is. I'm not bad at identifying who's going home. Um, pretty much all the way through this episode, I was like, oh, this is Katrine's boot episode. See, I was actually suspecting Lloyd because we saw a lot of Lloyd this week. Oh uh, yeah, well, I think that's for one of two reasons: either he's the mole, or he's just a brilliant character. He's just really funny. And also, on top of that, we didn't see Lloyd's suspicion at the end, which would have continued the pan. Yeah. So I was like, it's Lloyd's episode, really. Wow, was not expecting that. No, it's just Mama Katrine. Yeah, I was pretty comfortable it was Katrine because we've not really seen much of her and it was like this week they were just scraping together any content they got before she went home. 
And in her perfect final challenge, everyone has to race to the top of the 182 meter high Torre Latino America, which I actually spelled wrong in my notes, which slightly put me off then. Whoever reaches the top first gets an exemption for the test. Along the way, the lift will stop six times to let someone off, and they can earn up to 3,000 euros by answering either or questions within 30 seconds and bringing an envelope back to the lift, and then beginning to run up the stairs. If the person who has the money reaches the top first, they will win both the exemption and the money will go into the pot that they won. And this sort of challenge predictably results in everyone going for the exemption. No one cares about the money. Yeah, they're always going to go for exemptions rather than money. And I think, do you know what? The more I think about this show is, yeah, it's nice if they build up the pot, but nobody really cares how much they take home at the end. They just want to win this thing, don't they? And actually, they just want to get to the final because they're enjoying themselves so much. They don't want to go home. I think any time where it's cash or exemptions, that anything that gets you further in the game, forget the cash. Yeah, this is a show where I think the experience is most of the battle. And also the pot is actually at a level where it's still higher than Dutch was this year. Yeah, you're going you're to get a reasonable amount. You've you've had a couple of weeks away that's been fantastic. The odd thousand euros here and there, I don't think any of them really care about that. No, and it's it's not a show where some of the earlier English language mall seasons were advertising it as like up to a million dollars. It's like you're never actually going to make that much. No, no. If it was life-changing money, then it would be a different story, but... Belgium all always has the tone of being basically a family trip that also has a side of someone sabotaging. Yeah, it's, it's about playing a game, isn't it, and enjoying yourself. And, you know, there, there's so much social activity, so many evenings out, and they all get on really well. Yeah, you just want to stay in it as long as you can. And just making it abundantly clear, if British Mole ever comes back and I am not cast, I will cut a bitch. I desperately want to be <laughs> on this show. It's the one reality show that I would ever do. And yes, that includes Amazing Race. I wouldn't want to do Amazing Race because I'd be crap at it. Oh, I'd, I'd do it. I would be terrible and probably go out first, but I'd still go for it. Everyone would hate me, more so than they already do. <laughs> so the lift stops at six floors, which is floor 12 for Peter, floor 16 for Pascal, floor 19 for Steve, 23 for Yoka, 26 for Lloyd, and 31 for Baja. And the questions actually go quite well. Yeah, not bad at all. Peter knows that the mannequin piss or pissing statue's hand uh, is is left. It's a, I'm, I'm trying to think how to describe this without basically being <laughs> vulgar. The hand he yeah. uses is left. Yeah, he's he's a left he's left-handed. <laughs> the first three prime numbers are two, three, and five, which Pascal knows, and then Steve predictably gets his question wrong. See, it's a weird one for us, this as well, talking about this, doing this in English, because Steve's question was, true or false, this sentence has eight syllables. If you yeah. do that in English, the answer's true. Yeah. Evidently, if you do it in Flemish, the answer's false, and it's nine. Yeah. And I have to thank Hammerox Lamillion for teaching me the answer to Yoka's question, which was, when did Mexico have the World Cup? The answer is 1970. You don't know that. I sort of knew it in the back of my mind, but Hammerox actually had a task this year about it. 1970-1986. And on the stairs, Steve passes Pascal, as does Yoka, and then they both pass Peter before Yoka takes the lead. She does incredibly well on this. I, I was very surprised. I thought, yeah, being in the lift is the right place to be. You're never going to beat the lift to the top. But, hey, impressive. See, I'm not sure, because... I think the mole would want to be on the stairs. Mm-hmm. Something in the back of my mind says that in Steve's intro video, he said he's a marathon runner. Okay. Which should mean that he should be very good at this challenge. Well, he wasn't very good on the bike either, was he? Exactly. He does some sort of athletic pursuit. I can't remember what it is. I think it's a marathon runner. Ooh. So he should be good at endurance. And Lloyd skips his question in order to run for the rice telling. And his question was actually quite spoilerific, which is, who was Belgium's first mole? Was it either Magda or Hugo? Yeah. He picked correctly, but interestingly, Magda is a um, an anagram of a star sign in Dutch. Okay. Which is Virgo. Right. Who is the only Virgo in the cast? Uh, it's going to be Steve, isn't it? It's Lloyd. Hey! <laughs> Yeah, and I was I was surprised that Lloyd couldn't catch Yoka. Yeah, unless 
the mole saw Yoka thought, I'm never going to catch her, and thought she's going to win regardless. Yeah, I suppose if he thinks, yeah, I get that. So as as long as, long as someone gets there before the left, then that's job done, isn't it? Because you've stopped the money. You're giving a prize drilling to someone else, but you don't really care about that, I suppose. It doesn't matter at this stage. The mole doesn't care about exemptions or anything else the mole cares about stopping as much money going into the pot as is physically possible yeah so as long as yoko beats the left it doesn't matter whether he beats her or not does it no it's sort of something you've got to consider with every game is where can the mole place themselves to make sure as little money as possible gets into the pot because they Mm. don't want to get no money in the pot because that doesn't motivate anyone Mm. but they want to keep as much money out of the pot as is physically possible and getting 1,000 out of 13 in this episode is mission accomplished, I would say, for the mole. Oh, definitely. And Katrine encourages Baha, and his question is probably the easiest, which is, which floor are you on? And he gets it correct by saying 31. And Yoka claims the rice telling, and Lloyd collapses. Yeah. It did look like a lot of effort going up those stairs, I have to say. That's hard work, isn't it, climbing stairs? Really hard. It is, but Lloyd's collapse makes me suspect it isn't him. Purely because we've had that with a Belgian mole before. A very similar challenge. Hmm. Okay. A couple of seasons ago, same one as the, the Ruth paint bomb, the mole was challenged to basically race the subway in Buenos Aires and ended up getting there just too late and pretty much collapsing. Oh, uh, okay. So a little bit like you're trying too hard. To show how much effort you're putting in. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm going back and forth on Lloyd, because he's more of a suspect to me than he was last week. But still, he's doing a lot of stuff where I'm going, actually, you're not... You're just trying a bit too hard to look moly. Yeah, and th- that's why I think... that That's what's stopping me think that he could be. I, I, I'd like him to be the mole, because I think he's, you know, he's a good character anyway. He's a bit, for me, like Ruben in this year's Dutch Mole, in that he's he's doing a lot of stuff, but he, but are we seeing him doing a lot of stuff wrong because he's not the Mole, if that makes sense? You know, you, they don't tend to show you that many things that, that's moling until the final reveal when you go, oh, I never saw that. You're seeing everything that Lloyd's doing. So Weirdly, I was having this conversation with Bindles about good moles and bad moles earlier. Because I used the example of Ruben. I had to explain why Ruben isn't a great winner this year. Because, you know, we've had Hunted this year with two Mm -hmm. fantastic pairs of winners. But he appears worse because the two people he was in the final three with were all-time great characters. Because we had Jan as as one of the best moles ever. And we had Mm -hmm. Olche as one of the best characters ever. Yeah. So against those two, anyone is going to appear to be a worse character. Mm-hmm. Is my argument? Yeah, I would go along with that. But I, I really, I loved Ruben. I thought he was brilliant. I would have loved him to be the mole because he was just such a clown. See, I was really frustrated that Jan was the mole because I picked him week one, <laughs> and then he threw you off the scent. And then I got tipped off to different things, which put me onto Steena, and then mm-hmm. onto Simone, mm-hmm. and then back onto uh, to Jan. Finally, for the final two weeks, I don't think you were alone in the Steena Simone thing. So now, time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and the actions of the mole. Whoever knows least is out of the game. Apart from the mole, who never goes home? And Baha suspects Lloyd and Peter. Steve, we think, suspects Katrine. Peter has no suspicion. Katrine suspects Steve, Pascal and Yoka. Pascal suspects Yoka. Lloyd shows no suspicion. And Yoka doesn't take the test at all. And Steve gets the green screen before Katrine is executed. Yeah, no, no big fuss about taking the mole book back this week, but he, but he did have it in his hand. He did have it, definitely. I was gonna go back and try and watch episode two to see whether he had Janny's in his hand, but I suspect he did. I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah, it's, that's going to rebound somewhere down the line, isn't it? Yeah, they're making a big thing of the mole books being taken. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I wasn't surprised to see Katrine go. It felt like it's me pretty much all the way through the episode. I'm glad because she was she's the first person executed who was at who I actually put any points on on the suspect list. Okay. And I would rather all of my suspects but one go mm. personally just so I can be laser focused and just start by 100 points on Steve. <laughs> yeah. But it's sad because I never really believed that she was the mole. She never put herself in 
enough places to be the mole, I don't think, but there was always that niggling suspicion it might have been her. Yeah, I think because in the first, well, the first half of the series, really, you can not know a lot about the candidates, which, you know, can often be the case that one of them is a mole and that's why you're not seeing much of them. So when someone that you haven't really seen much of goes home, then that's it. You, you can scrub them, you know, they, you're just not worried about them. Um, I'd rather be focusing on people that we are seeing stuff about. Yeah, I mean, the best example this season is Chani, who had zero content in her boot episode. Yeah, that's true. And there was a sign in Katrine's taxi. I'm I'm just looking for clues now. There's a sign in Katrine's taxi, which I'm assuming was the number plate, but I don't know for certain. Okay. It said H07AFM. It's the sort of thing they would love to hide as a clue of some description, but I don't know what it could stand for. You've got the added complexity that it, it might mean something in, in Flemish. <laughs> and Lloyd says that he knows his mum is coming. Yeah. So what's that? Family family reunion episode or something? It's definitely family visit next week. We saw the families. How did you know that? Yeah. Would them all be that obvious? And that, that's the thing. That, that There is just too much. Surely they wouldn't show them all saying that. And uh, there was there was a thing early in the episode where he's he's absolutely grinning his head off, going, "Ha <laughs> we're such losers." And you think oh, I, that can't be a mole thing to say because it's just too much. It's too molly. And I've seen a clip of the family members actually, and I have some thoughts. So next time there is a drive-in cinema, Steve goes on a roller coaster, which I can't wait for already. <laughs> there is a family visit and a literal Mexican standoff. Yeah. Which I had to be very quiet last night, but I was cackling when Gilles said Mexican standoff. Yeah. Are we going to get some uh, laser tag, do you think? It's paintball again. Ah, I much prefer lasers. <laughs> it's 100% paintball because there is a clip that they have released of everyone wearing paintball masks this time. Ah, uh, okay. Not just Joker. Okay. Um, it looks like it's all family members apart from Steve. Peters is definitely his brother, because they look identical. Pascal's looks like her son. Lloyd is his mum, definitely. I think Yoka looks like a sister. Steve's definitely his wife. I think Baha is brother. Ooh. You'll see what I mean when we finally get um, the episode, but seriously, Peter's brother is the spitting image of him. You cannot mistake that they are related. Excellent. And I can't wait for them to go on roller coasters. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. I can't remember whether it was in the preview or whether it's in another clip I've seen, but Steve, at one point, has his head over the, the restraints just going, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's a, uh, you have to stay on the roller coaster until you do something? Like, you, until you solve a puzzle, you have to keep going again and again? I think so, or it might be a, you've got a spot assigned. Yeah, yeah, kind of, a, kind of an amazing race type task. Get back to, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel for Steve because I hate those sort of roller coasters with a passion. I love them. I love roller coasters. I love roller coasters. I don't. The two things I hate are when I don't feel safe on a roller coaster and when I go upside down. I don't mind upside down. Spinning, I don't like, but going upside down is fine. Like the the big dipper at Blackpool Pleasure Beach is the best example I use of this. I went on a weekend away with my friends in sick form. And we went, got dragged on the Big Dipper and did not want to do it. And two weeks later, it crashed. I was going to say, there's a reason you don't feel safe on the Big Dipper. <laughs> yeah, I said, I said to them, I do not feel safe on this ride because it was, it was so rickety. And then two weeks later, the news came out that actually two of the cars had crashed. And I sent it around to the group chat just going, I told you so. <laughs> I'm never trusting you guys again. <laughs> so who is the suspect list? Okay, so you know Lloyd's there for me. I'm going to stick with it. I'm sure I'm being misled, but I'm quite happy about that because if I get tunnel vision on Lloyd, then I'll get to the final episode and it'll be a big reveal, so I'm happy with that. Um, Pascal's quite high for me at the minute. Um, uh, do you know what? The only reason I'm not saying Steve is because you are. I think, I think I'm just being belligerent about it. Um, that doesn't sound like you. I know. I just want you to be wrong, so therefore it, it can't be him. Uh, but it could it could be. By default, I am probably going to be wrong, by the way. I have terrible, <laughs> a terrible record with Belgian Mall. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable. I don't think it's Peter. I don't think it's Baha. I don't think it's Joker. 
So if I'm, who's in the middle then? It could be Lloyd. Yeah, it could be. Could be Lloyd. Yeah, Lloyd Pascal, possibly Steve, for me. I have the same three, but flipped. Okay. Steve's my number one. Pascal's my number two, and Lloyd is my number three. Yeah, but it is very much process of elimination at the minute. It could be any of those. Yeah, I can't see it being Baha and Yoko, especially Peter. I hope it's not because whilst the idea of having Lol the Mole is a priest. It conflicts with his beliefs. Is quite fun. I just can't see him having sabotaged as much. No, I, I, he's not been in the position to do it. So if if he if he is, he's doing an amazing job because I don't know how he's moling. And I'm sure we would find out in that case. But mm-hmm. like, I just can't see it being those three. Which hopefully gives us a three person group that we can dominate the suspect list with. Yeah, I think so. We have sadly reached the point now, though, where whoever goes home next week, it's going to be sad, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. Who do you think it will be? Um, Baha. Selfishly, I hope it's Lloyd just because it screws up your suspect list. Of course. It'd be great if it was Steve too, but I don't think it will be. Yeah, I think it's probably going to be Peter or Baha, honestly. I could see it being Peter. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those two. The, the only reason I think it's Baha rather than Peter is just Baha seems more into the games and, and he seems a bit more in the moment. I I don't imagine he's he's good at analysing things as much as Peter. So I think he will he will go out by virtue of just missing clues. Yeah. It's interesting that we've got to the point now where people are being eliminated and we're actually seeing their suspicions. Yeah. Because we don't know... Th- the distribution of what Katrine put on Steve, Pascal, and Yoka. But was it enough to get her eliminated if she put, say, more on Yoka, who we don't believe is the mole? Mm. And you don't know how close it is, do you? We know it wasn't a tie, because she loves to announce a tie. Yeah, but it could be one question, couldn't it? And, you know, the, the difference between top and bottom could be, like, two or three questions. I'm not sure if Belgian mole uses the same policy as Dutch mole in that the mole still has to answer the the test as themselves, basically. Or whether Belgian moles can just sort of go, ah, it's fun. I can put whoever I want on it. Hmm. I don't know. You, you mean, they should get them all right, shouldn't they? <laughs> really? <laughs> Regardless. They should, but in certain franchises they don't have to. Right, okay. In certain franchises the mole scores counted, in certain they're not, basically. Right. And this isn't the first week we've seen Steve have the Illumini as his main suspects as well. That's just something else to note. I think, this is, I think this is the second one. I think he put it on Kelly in week one. I'd have to go back to my notes and check that, but I'm pretty sure Steve did. Mm. I mean, it's great, isn't it, if you are the mole? Because it throws you off completely, I suppose. Because mm. he knows he's going home, really, doesn't he? He's going to have a pretty strong idea. So, is there anything else to say? No, other than what I said at the beginning is, you know, I came into this with eyes open, but but honestly not expecting it to be as good as the Dutch version. And I think that's, you know, credit to that. I, I could be wrong on that. I think by the end of this season, this could be my favourite franchise. I'm very, very happy that I've pestered Logan and Michelle especially for years to watch Foreign Moles with me. You already watched Dutch Moles, so I didn't need to pester you as much. But I've pestered the three of you to watch Belgian Mole with me this year, and holy shit has it worked out. Yes! Yeah, it's great. Let's just hope we get to watch the end of the season. Well, we'll get to watch the end of the season regardless. It's whether we get to watch it with subtitles. <laughs> Hand on heart, I can say that Belgium Mole is the most consistent show that we cover on Reality TV Warriors. There has not been a bad episode. Mm. And also, if you have never seen last year's Family Visit episode, make sure you watch it. It is the greatest episode of reality television ever created. Wow. It's comedy gold. <laughs> There's three challenges. Drunk Museum Heist, Ostrich Scrabble, where Gilles gets to just slam people down, and then Swimming with Sharks and a, a family puzzle game. It's the best. <laughs> Maybe I'll check that out. But yeah, it's consistently the best show that we cover, I think. And I look forward every week to watching Belgium Mall, so I'm glad that we have finally broken you guys down enough for us to podcast it. <laughs> yeah, and and I think our usual plea to anybody in the industry is, why is there not an English language version of this show? Please, somebody make it happen. Why is there not an English version of this show again? 
I desperately want to be involved in a UK mole. I don't know. I don't care about any other show that we cover in terms of it coming over to the UK. I want this show. And also our usual plea of, if there's anyone in Belgian production involved, please get in, in contact with us. We love all that sort of stuff. And if you want to send us tickets to Café de Mall, I'll happily take them off here. <laughs> or alternatively, the apparently live finale they're having this year. I'll happily be in the audience, won't understand a word, happily be there. Yep, me too. And also one other thing that I haven't mentioned in the previous week's podcast, but thank you to you for actually doing our intro music. Oh yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I've not actually drawn attention to the fact that we do have the Anthony Williams cover of the Dutch Mole theme as our, our theme for Belgian Mole podcast. Yeah, it is very rough, I'm afraid, but it'll do. Yeah, good enough. I don't care. It'll do. Better than me trying to uh, to stumble my way through doing it. <laughs> could have done a kazoo version or something. Maybe that's what we should have done every week, have a different instrument version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, maybe next season. Maybe we forget to do Dutch next year. Oh, we're doing Dutch next year. Yeah, so just don't clash it with anything, please, producers. Yeah, Amazing Race, producers, if somehow you're listening, if you bring Amazing Race 31 back in January, I'm not covering it this time, I'm doing Dutch Mall. So, (laughs) it's your choice. I'm sure that's really high on their list of things to worry about. It should be, because I'm still pissed off at (laughs) South 30. So thank you for joining us for this Belgian Mall podcast, and we will hopefully be back next week. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our Twitter account, our TV Warriors, or our own Twitter pages, MJ Helmstone for me, and Bullsboy for Anthony. See you next week. Laters.